Good morning, everybody. Surprising how little this actually dampens the microphone. I could probably just wear it, huh? Except I don't want to. Good morning. It's glad to have. We're glad to have you here. Such a wonderful morning to, to join and sing together. Whether you're joining us here in person or at home, we're glad that you've taken the time out of your morning to join with us to, to worship together. There's something about being together when we worship that makes it all that much better. We're grateful for that. So let's get our morning started. Let's stand and sing together.
wonderful reminder that one day, that, that, that picture, people from every nation, every tongue, before the Lord, saying, you are good. You are good. That the things that unite us in Christ are stronger than our differences. That, that often when we see that people from every nation, from every tongue, from any, every generation, we, we think about the things that, that separate us as human beings on this planet. A couple weeks ago, we talked about you know, being united in following Jesus is, is stronger than the difference between the color of our skin. And this week, I'm reminded that being united in following Jesus is stronger than the color of our ballots. That no matter how we draw the lines, Jesus was the one to cross the lines, bring people together, to stand in the gap. And that's why we worship him today. Keep singing.
surrender to our hearts to praise you for everything that you've done and everything that you are. As the days roll forward, may we wake up every morning reminded of your song, of your praise. Whatever we face that day, may we reach the end of it still with that song in our hearts. set aside that moment every week. It's a time that we do regularly to remind ourselves, to, to be reminded with the bread and the cup that God is in control. That He does love you and I. And he proved it by going to the cross. And whenever we are tempted to, to allow the, the burdens of this world to overwhelm Sometimes we just need that moment to go back to the beginning. Because he's always waiting there. Whatever troubles we have, he can handle it. Whatever burdens we carry, he can shoulder it. Whatever failures we dwell on, he can forgive it. His arms are always open wide, waiting for us to come back. Let's sing again. is called. 
Good morning. <clears throat> As we come to this portion of our service, where we not necessarily gather at the altar, but we gather at the foot of the cross, <clears throat> as I prepared this week, I couldn't help but bring into perspective all the events of this past week. <clears throat> and I thought about the turmoil, turmoil that has been a part of the country this week, and probably will continue to be for the next few weeks. <clears throat> But as I thought about that, I looked in the book of John, and John records this event early. He's the only one that records it early in his book. There's a similar event that is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke later on. But John writes this for us. It was near the Passover. It was almost time for the Jewish Passover. Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. <clears throat> and as I thought about that, as I read that, I thought about that. Folks, that needs to be us now. Zeal for the Father's house needs to consume us. Uh, this nation is going to go through a radical change, I suspect, uh, over the course of the next few years. But nothing has changed at the foot of the cross. Jesus Christ came here to pay a price that would give us eternal life. John went on to record this. <clears throat> said, Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build the temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple that he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from this dead, dead his disciples recalled what he had said, and then they believed the Scripture in the words that Jesus had spoken. And as we gather here at the foot of the cross, it's to remember that very fact. Jesus Christ, for us, endured all that He endured, went to the cross of Calvary, ultimately died for you and I. But you know what? Just as He stated, on that third day, He raised that temple again. And on that third day, He opened the doors of salvation for you and I. And that's what we need to remember when we gather at the foot of the cross. He loved us enough to give His life so that we could live
forever with him. Let's give thanks. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we do have this opportunity to gather here. An opportunity indeed to reflect on the price that you were willing to pay for each one of us. And Father, now as we prepare to partake of these emblems that are a representation of your body and blood, we pray, Father, that you will open our hearts and minds to be more acceptive of the gift that you have given us and give us the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with those that we come in contact with. Father, we thank you so much that you did love us that much. And we just ask and pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the loaf that we hold indeed is a representation of the body of Jesus Christ given for you and I. Let us partake. <clears throat> The cup, likewise, is a representation of the blood that was shed that day. The blood that has the power to wash away all sin. Of the blood that opened the door. That one day is going to be the fulfillment of the promise. And it's getting closer every day. He's coming back. And on that day, he's going to take all of his followers home. Let's partake. <clears throat> All right. Also, would like to take a moment to offer up thanks for the tithes and offerings. Obviously, we don't pass the plates any longer. We do have a plate in the back if, uh, if you desire to drop an offering back there. Uh, for those at home, we do have an online portal. But I think it's important that God is blessing us and give Him the due thanks for the blessings that He does shower on us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time again that we can be together. A time to fellowship, a time to worship, God, a time to now return to you a portion of that which you have so blessed us with. We pray, Father, that you will use these tithes and offerings to the upbuilding of your kingdom. And we ask and pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning again, folks. Wanted to uh, very quickly uh, share some announcements uh, with respect to the children's ministry and some of the things that we're starting soon. As you were walking in, you probably saw that in addition to the normal church bulletin, we had this little flyer here. It's got the blue header at the top. If you are a parent of a small child, you want to make sure you grab one of these. If you're joining us from home, uh, we're going to put a link in the stream to all the information, but I'm just going to very quickly explain it and uh, kind of the next steps that we're going to be taking. Uh, about two months ago, we had put out a, a survey of all the parents and people who had been volunteering with our children uh, pre-COVID and asking, you know, hey, what's your comfort level? What, what sort of steps do you want to see us taking? Uh, are you willing to volunteer? And, and how can we make those steps towards getting some children's services back into the church? And based on that, we are going to be starting uh, a very limited kind of first step towards children's services next week. And we'll be doing that twice a month, not, a, not every week, but, but twice a month. We're going to have nursery and up through kindergarten during the service. So if you are, if you, especially those of you who parents who have been joining us online and have been unable to come in because of small children and needing to watch them, we just want to make sure that you know that we feel for you and we don't want to leave you out. So th those of you who have children, uh, you want to make sure you have that. There are a, a, a number of precautions that we're going to be taking, and those are all spelled out on the flyer. We want to make sure that we're being as safe as possible while we're doing that. Thank you. Everybody? There we go. Good morning. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Mike. I'm one of the ministers here. We're glad that you are here with us. We're gl well, uh, glad for those who are, are joining us at home. If you would, at some point during uh, today, uh, let us know uh, how you are connecting with us, either here in the house or online. You can do so at cchmd.com slash connect. Fill out the connection card there. We would love to just kind of know uh, where everyone is at this morning. Uh, you can also follow along with uh, the sermon notes today on uh, the Version Bible app. If you search for uh, Church of Christ at Hagerstown, uh, today's sermon is Give to God First, or Give 
Yeah, something, something along those lines. Give and God and first are in the title. What order those are in, uh, you make them up as you go along. But uh, we're glad that you are, are here and joining with us. As, uh, as Mark said, if you have a chance to, uh, if you're not here with us and want to participate in the offering, you can do so uh, at, uh, at cchmd.com slash give. You can also get to that off of the Connect page there as well. So it's just kind of a one-stop shop. Uh, get all of our videos and all of our uh, uh, kind of connections right there on the Connect page. Uh, you can always just kind of save that and be able to go back to that at any time. So uh, we are glad that you are here with us as we start a new series uh, this morning. Uh, but before we do, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you. Uh, Father, at this time when we feel like we have a divided nation, Father, what we most need is a united church. So Father, I pray that you would help us to unite around your son. Father, we would lift him up, Father, for you are good. You are, are high above all, that you are, 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 are the one in whom we worship, the one in whom we stand, the one in whom uh, we go to. You're our firm foundation. Father, we thank you that you, this is your world, and we get to live in it and participate in the blessings that you've given us. So, Father, help us to be good stewards of those. Father, the resources you've blessed us with, may we use them to further your kingdom. May we use them uh, to do good. May we use them to help others, that your mission would be advanced. And that, the, 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 that others would come to know Jesus as Savior and as Lord. They would come to the altar and find forgiveness and find grace and find the hope that they need. Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus. And in his name I pray. Amen. My dad is pretty amazing. And he is like some form of human calculator. I mean, he can just, he can do all sorts of math in his head. I remember as a child, we'd go on vacation, and as we were rolling out of town, mom and dad would always stop by the bank, and they would get the cash they would need for the trip. And they would, mom would have the cash in one of those bank envelopes. Remember the bank envelopes that you used to get? You know, you'd tell her, you know, nowadays it's just ATMs, like, give me my money. And, but, now, but it used to be you had to send that little tube, that little thing up the tube and back, and, and you, they'd send you back your, your, your money in, in an envelope. And my mom loves her envelopes, and so, um, and, and so she, would ha- she would keep the envelope with her in her purse, and along the way, they would, we, we would need to stop for something to eat. We would need to uh, stop to spend the night somewhere, and each time, mom would use the cash, and she would write down how much we spent. And somewhere along the way, uh, mom and dad would decide, we, we, we probably should take a little bit of an audit, make sure that you know, nothing's gone missing, and so they would start with the opening balance, and mom would just read off, you know, dinner was this, Hotel was that, just on down the line. And dad would keep it, the ta- he would keep doing the math in his head, and he was within a dollar every time. Every time. It was just, it was, un- I mean, he, yeah, I, I would guess that there were probably sometime, he was like down to the cent. Uh, uh, accurate. I mean, my dad is amazing at math. And I, can, I find myself uh, being very much the same way, and I see it in, in, in Jaden as well. I mean, numbers come easily to us, and we can put them together quickly and accurately most of the time. So much so that if I wasn't called to ministry, I probably would have gone into engineering just like my dad. Another thing my dad taught me, from the very first time I received an allowance, was that I needed to honor God with the money that I've been given. See, my parents modeled for me generosity. My, my parents uh, they didn't just tithe to the church. They, they didn't just give 10% of their income, but they would give above and beyond to church and to ministry and to, and to uh, different events and different projects that our church was doing. My parents lived a life of generosity. They, they live a life of generosity. They're, they're still with us. So they, they, they're, <laughs> they're continuing to live a life of generosity. Many of you may not know this, but my parents are faithful givers to this church as well. Not to just this church, but the church they attend at home. It's been an important part of my spiritual formation. That the, 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 the money and the resources that have been given to me aren't just my own. It meant that I would have to, delay, it meant growing up, growing, as I was growing up, it meant I had to delay purchases that I wanted to make because the money and the resources that I've been given were more than just for the things that I wanted, but that some need to be returned to God. And I, and I love thinking about it that way because it's all God's. Right? A lot of times you think it's offering this is when I gotta give my money back to God, right? I gotta give my it's one, it's not your money. And two, we're not giving it, we're returning it because it's all his. And we return it to him because he's been faithful to give it to us. 
And there have been periods and there have been times in our marriage where finances have been tight. We've given faithfully. We've never doubted God's provision. So this is where we're going to camp out for the next few weeks. We're going to look at financial management from God's perspective. That scripture teaches that everything belongs to God, that we are just managers, we're just stewards of it. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. From from, uh, possessions to finances, God gives us a, a possession of all the things that we need to be used for our needs and the good of others. So our obedience and and stewardship reveals the depth of our discipleship. Today, we're going to begin with some wise words from Solomon. So if you would, turn with me to uh, to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And Solomon, just like my dad, is passing on words of wisdom to his son. Son, here's how you ought to live. Here's how you ought to, to, to manage your life, manage your resources. And, and, and we see that if you read through the Proverbs, you know, one good uh, thing for, for reading, through, reading your Bible each day is to, is to choose uh, the date, uh, the, the, the number of the date that it is, and, and read that proverb. Just read that chapter. And you can, you know, once a month, go through the Proverbs. You know, sometimes you're, you know, every, other month, every other month or so you're going to skip 31, but, or maybe you just double up on 30 and read 30 and 31. But if you go through pages of Proverbs, you will live a life of wisdom. As Solomon pours out the heart of God through his wisdom to his son and on down to us. And when we read through the Proverbs, we begin to see real value in aligning ourselves with the way and the path of God. Because the pitfalls are real, right? But so are the rewards. And some of the pitfalls we may not see, but the pitfalls are there nonetheless. And it's not just the consequences for our missteps, but the rewards for our wise choices. The rewards that can have a multiplying effect in our life. This is what Solomon writes for us. He says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. He says, Honor the Lord with your wealth. That's, that's, that's where Solomon starts. He says, he, he, we're, start, we're going to talk a little bit here about money. We're going to talk a little bit about finances. Son, here's what you need to listen. Here's what you need to do with your life. When it comes to finances, when it comes to your money, you need to honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Now, this idea of first fruits kind of gets lost on us a little bit, doesn't it? Because most of us aren't making our living off the land. I mean, we may have gardens. We may uh, grow some vegetables. We may uh, raise uh, s- some chickens or some other uh, animals. But really, we're doing that more so for ourselves and for our own benefit and not to take to market and to sell, right? We're not really so much living off of the land anymore. And so this idea of first fruits kind of gets a little bit lost on us. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not trading in our produce for other things. So how does this translate to a cash or currency society. See, there were some back in the day that as their harvest would come in, they would set aside one out of every ten. So maybe they harvested corn. One, two, three, four. You know, one for God, nine for me. One for God, nine for me. You know, maybe they'd, you know, they had peas. One for God, nine for me. Right? You know, and so, so whatever it is, they would they'd set aside one for God and nine for them. And they would, maybe they would take the, that to the church. They would take that to the synagogue. They would take that to the temple and say, hey, here's, here's some food. This is, this is a tithe of what the Lord has given me. And so, so God has blessed me with this. I'm giving this to you and, and distribute it as is best. Maybe they would take it to market. And maybe they would sell that. And then as they would earn money from the, 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 the food that came in, they would set aside one for God, nine for me. And they'd bring a financial offering to God. The church. But we're not selling tomatoes and corn and peas and chickens and goats and lambs. We have a different kind of first fruits, don't we? So how does this look for us? We live in this, this cash, this kind of currency society. We trade uh, uh, our abilities and we trade our skills and our talents for a paycheck. And I think how this looks for us is it means that returning to God needs to be the first line of our budget. 
before housing, before debt, before food. We need to make, put God on the first line of our budget. It also means that if we need to make cuts in our budget, that we go to other line items to do that. And if you're doing it based on a percentage, of course, if your income goes down, then your percentage is going to go down as well. But if the money is the same, there needs to be cuts. Fine, we don't cut from, we don't, return, we don't cheap out on God. It also looks like if, 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 whether we are attending church in person or not, that we make sure that our offering comes. Or that we make sure that our offering is given, that our offering arrives, whether we are here or not. So maybe you use our online giving portal. Maybe uh, you, you're coming every other week or every third week. Maybe you only give once a month, but do you, are you giving re- regularly? Are you giving routinely? Are you using uh, uh, kind of a, a percentage base? Are you giving consistently, returning back to God, whether you are present with us in the house or not? As Paul talks about, and we will talk about this uh, ne- next week, he says you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. So I could stand up here and say, hey, everyone needs to give X amount. But guess what? That X amount might be easy for some. It might be impossible for others. It, 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 you know, whatever amount we'd say, maybe, maybe that amount, some, that, that, they give that without hurting at all, but it would maybe wreck someone else's life. Giving shouldn't be a burden. It should be a joy. And it, ought, it comes out of the bounty that God has given to us. Are we giving regularly? Are we giving routinely? Are we giving consistently? Are we returning back to God that which already belongs to Him? Solomon says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all that you've been given. We honor the Lord when we put Him first in our finances. When we give to Him before we spend on ourselves. When we return, when we recognize that what we've been given is not ours, that it all belongs to Him that first came from Him, that wealth is a tool that God has blessed us with. The reason why there are some who want to redistribute wealth is because some have used wealth as a tool to hold others back. Part of the reason why the lottery is a trap for the poor, they see it as a way to turn the tables for themselves. But in the end, they are truly just paying a tax that rarely pays out. And when it does, it often leads to greater financial ruin. There are verses in the Bible that say, beware of getting rich quick. Beware of coming across fast money. So when we realize that wealth, the wealth we have is a tool, not only take care of our needs, but also to benefit those around us, it ought to change the way, everything about the way we view our financial picture, how we view our time, how we view our talent, how we view our treasure. Do we use our time to pour into the lives of others? Do we use our talents to ease the lives of others, to make others better, to to add value to their life? And do we use the treasure we have to assist those around them Help give them a leg up. Mark mentioned a, a few weeks back our partnership with groups like IDES, Habitat for Humanity, with the Reach Shelter here in town. We use our time and our talent and our treasure to pour into these, these organizations. And it has a multiplying effect, right? I mean, I by myself could not go out and build a house. I mean, I can, I can hit a nail in the wood, occasionally straight, right? And so, and then that's, that's helpful when building a house. Uh, but I, by myself, if I try to build a house by myself, it would take a long time, right? The people probably would die before they got to go into their house. But when a number of people come around a certain project, a number of different churches pool their money together, then all of a sudden, Ides can go into Central America, go into Louisiana, where hurricanes have struck. Begin, begin to help churches and, and communities put their lives back together. How much, 
how much impact could we have individually as a church? Not much. When we partner together with others, all of a sudden there's this multiplying effect, right? There's this multiplying effect that we begin to use our resources for God's glory. He has this multiplying effect on it. In modern financial management, there's a term that is best known by its three-letter acronym, ROI. It stands for Return on Investment. You'll hear people say, well, well, what's the ROI? What's what's the return? What what am I going to get back from what I put in? Am I chasing good money after bad? Am I just throwing money away? Or will this investment net me something in return? And Solomon says that if we honor the Lord with our wealth, if we honor him with the first fruits (coughs) of all of our crops, then our barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will will brim over with new wine. Now, moment of transparency here. I've never owned a barn and I've never made wine. But I bet if I had a barn, I would want it to be overflowing. And I bet if... I made wine, I, uh, having your vat overflow with new wine is probably a good thing as well. These are images, these are pictures of abundance. These are pictures of the multiplying effect of the blessing of God when we honor him with our wealth. These are the benefits of being a good steward of the resources God has put at our disposal. But here's the problem. Oftentimes we think God is going to bless us in a one-to-one relationship, right? Right? If I honor God with my money, he is then going to bless me back with more money, right? We tend to, we tend to think, if I, if I bring this gift to God, I'm going to get a like gift in return, but more because God blesses me over and abundantly, right? He says, you're going to make my barn overflow and my, my vats overflow. This is going to be a good thing, so I'm going to give a little bit of money here, and I'm going to get a little bit of money back there. But what God has never promised is he never promises to reward our monetary faithfulness with a monetary reward. God has never promised to reward our monetary faithfulness with a monetary reward. See, this is how the health and wealth gospel kind of gets its, it finds its home. It's like, hey, if you send me X amount of dollars, God will bless you 10 times in return, right? And people are, man, that's a, tenfold? I mean, I am down with that, right? But five, no, make, make, it, make it 100. If I'm going to get 10 times in return, right? And then all of a sudden, doesn't come in, but like, well, is God not faithful? I mean, I like, I like that guy, but, but, but why is God not giving me back what this guy said? Because God never promised to reward our monetary faithfulness with a monetary reward. And see, that's why you know, those who believe in God, for those who are faithful to Him with their finances, He will bless their life. But it may not always come in the way that we think. This explains why there are some families who are faithful to God with their finances, but always find themselves a little bit tight. Maybe in their life, maybe they've chained themselves to some debt. Maybe they've made some unwise purchases or unwise commitments that have held them back. And so this is a picture of the blessing of God, the blessings that we get, the blessings that we get from Him, we're not going to be able to contain them but they may not always come in the way that we think they're going to come. They think is more than just a number, more than just a percentage, more than just consistency. Jesus says that giving is about the heart. If we give, merely get a blessing return. You know, I'm going to put a little bit extra in the offering plate because I need a little extra blessing this week. I think we missed the point of stewardship. Jesus says, you know, store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So if, we, if we're putting in an earthly offering, expecting an earthly reward, our earthly reward is going to get eaten up. It's going to, be, it's going to rust. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to go away. It's going to be short-lived. So he says, don't store up treasures on, on earth. Where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if we're thinking, man, how do I build up? How do I diversify? How do I, how do I gain treasure here on earth? Our reward will be here on earth. If we give merely to get a, a monetary return, if we're, if we're giving a, a, an offering to God merely to get something in the here and now, our blessing will be limited. See, the gospel is not a transactional experience. It's not a do this, get that kind of thing. You know? we, we talk about salvation, the gospel is a journey. We take these steps to arrive. It's not about a transaction. God's not like, hey, check all these boxes. See, there's this thing about the heart, that our heart has to be in the right place. If our heart isn't in the right place, none of our steps matter. It's not like we arrive and we check, 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 and then we're there. If we're not following God with a whole heart. None of it matters. If we choose to give our lives only for a life here on earth, then we'll receive only rewards and resources for this life. And it's banking that this life is all that there is. That there's nothing coming in the world to come. It explains why some people seem to succeed here in this life. They have no desire to live for or serve God. Because they're banking on their treasure here being enough. They don't, they're not focused on a world to come. They're not focused on following or obeying God. They're not focused on what is next. They're only focused on the here and now. See, for merely after material wealth, for material life here on earth, those rewards will not carry over to the life to come. There will be a different ledger used there to give an account. When God calls us to give an account of our life. It will not include stocks or bonds or dividends. You know, savings accounts or checking accounts or money markets to consider. The question will be, what have we done with his son, Jesus? And have we been faithful to use the resources at our disposal to serve others and to advance his kingdom? This is why being a good person is not good enough. It's not merely about doing the right things. It's not merely about uh, showing up and, and, and doing the right things or saying the right things at the right time. It's not about being a good person. It's not good enough. Unless we make Jesus our Savior, all of our actions are to serve our own ends. It's just altruistic, right? We're not doing them to serve God. We're doing them to make ourselves feel better. Even if we're doing it intrinsically, we do it because, hey, you know what? I'm a good person. This is what good people do. Good people do these things. But good people doing good things does not equal salvation. Because all good people are still sinners. We need the grace of God applied to their life. And if we're not serving God with the life he's given us, then we're not using the resources at our disposal to honor God and advance his kingdom. See, but when we make Jesus our Savior, it ought to reorient the trajectory of our life. We ought to begin to see our resources at our disposal as blessings from God to be used for our needs, right? We, we uh, acquire money. It's good to be used for houses and clothes and food, right? I mean, because we want to live in a safe, warm place. We prefer to go out in public with clothes on, and we all like to eat a couple times a day, right? So if you're using your money wisely for those things, that is, that is good, right? God's given us resources for those things, but he's also given us money, resources at our disposal to be used for the good of others. So maybe you see or you know of an organization that does good things, and you give some money to them each month or a little bit of time or from time to time. That's probably a good thing. You return to God and his church so that we can carry on the mission of God in this place. That's that's a good thing. Does the church then use those resources to, to further the gospel both locally and around the world? That's, that's a good thing. 
We're not called to neglect what we truly need in life, but there is a call of sacrifice to help benefit the world around us. Jesus calls us to give up the demands for our life, to honor Him with our life, to repent of our sins, to choose Him as our Lord and Savior, to be obedient to Him in baptism. And and the reward He gives us, He gives us forgiveness for our sins. He gives us the presence of His Holy Spirit in our life that continually helps us be more like Him, that, that, that serves as a guide, as a conscience. So as we go through life, and hey, God wants me to interact with this person right here. You know? Have you ever driven down the street and you saw someone, you're like, man, I really should stop and give them a ride. It seems completely unnatural and it seems a little bit unsafe, but I've got this pull up to this intersection. You see someone needing money. I don't do this all, all, always, but something about today, and there's something about this person, there's something about this moment, that I think God wants me to give them something. Maybe there's that person in the neighborhood or at work, and you're like, I know if I get in a conversation with them, they're just going to unload their whole laundry list of things, and I got things I need to do, but... Maybe the Holy Spirit's saying, today you need to stop and listen. Maybe they just need an ear. Maybe they just need a friend. Maybe they just need a word of encouragement. Are we using our life? Are we stewarding the time, talent, and treasure that's been given to us to further God's kingdom here on earth? If we go through the steps of salvation, but doesn't change the way we behave, doesn't change the way we act, doesn't change the way we think, then are we really giving ourselves fully to God? The reward is more than just an eternity in heaven. See, the gifts that God give us, gives us are like love and joy and peace, patience. The other fruit of the Spirit that we talked about this summer it ought to change the way we live, it ought to change the way we interact with the world around us. The purpose of life here, the purpose of the kingdom that we serve. So when we live our lives in alignment with God, there's always a double benefit. One, for the here and now. We see that in the fruit of the Spirit. We see that in the, in, in, in the joy. We see that in the, in the satisfaction in our life. But there's always one for later what Jesus meant by storing up our treasure in heaven. Because our, our, our faithfulness here and now does not always equate to a reward here and now. Sometimes we're just paying it forward. So if you want to know the salvation that you can have, if you want to know about the reward both here and now and in the life to come, that it can only be found in Jesus, we'd like to help you make that come come to walk, walk that journey. We'd love to have you have you come to that decision. You can let us know at cchmd.com slash connect there on the connection card. You can select the box become a Christian. You can text the word life to two four zero three four seven zero eight nine seven. And we can help you walk through this process of, of, of no longer living life merely for ourselves. We begin to the plan and begin to live out our life in a way that would reflect the wisdom of God. That we would see, as we honor the Lord with our wealth, with our time, with our first fruits, with the talents He's given us, with the treasure He's given us, that He would give us a multiplying life, a life that overflows with the blessings he longs to give. See, our faith, our relationship with Jesus is much more than about the life to come. It also helps us to live wisely here on earth. helps us to love our neighbors as ourselves. It helps us be good stewards of the resources at our disposal and to help connect others to Jesus. See, the role of the church is not just about experiencing the kingdom of God in heaven one day. It's also about helping bring the kingdom of God in a time when our country seems so divided, 
One thing our country most needs right now is a united church. A church that unites around Jesus, his mission, and his hope for the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you that you are our great God and King. Father, you love us. and You've given the very best for us. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to be wise. Help us to be good stewards. Help us to, to live out a life of stewardship. Not with just the financial resources you've given us, but the talents you've put in our hands, but the, the, tr- the, the, the time that you've given us, the opportunities we have each week to encounter others along our way. May we be good stewards of those moments and encourage them to walk and step with you. Father, may we live it first. May we give you the best of our life that you, because you have given your best already to us. Father, I thank you for this day. Father, for the reminder of your goodness. For the reminder that we live in your world and that all that we have comes from you. Father, may we bless you. May we bless others through the resources you've given us. May we help bring others the foot of the cross, that they may make Jesus their Savior. Father, you are good. May we walk in your goodness this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey guys, we are glad that you're here with us. Uh, as I said, let us know you're here at cchmd.com slash connect. You guys will participate in the offering there from off the giving link. And uh, hope you guys have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.